I'm going to be doing this word study on the word carnal. And I printed out all these word studies a long time ago, and I just I wanted to go over them. So this is a quick one. It's only a couple of pages. Uh, the word's not used a lot in Scripture. It's only used a few times in the Old Testament, <coughs> only in Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, if this is accurate, I used this for, uh, printed this out from a website. I don't know. I looked at Webster's 1828 Dictionary's uh, definition of the word carnally. It says, according to the flesh, in a manner to gratify the flesh or sensual desire. And so the word <coughs> carnal, uh, we have carnally in the Old Testament. And it's pretty much the same thing in each one. A commandment against adultery is what it seems like. Leviticus 18, verse 20 says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And an interesting thing to me is that sometimes I think Christians um, think that the word carnal is always like a negative thing. And... And that could be because of verses in the New Testament that I'll read later, but I don't think the, car the word carnal is always negative, particularly. It can be positive or negative. It depends on how it's used. And I'm wondering if, you know, it says, Thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. So I don't think that... I'm thinking that lying carnally with somebody which obviously means sex in this context. Um, I wonder, can it be said that a husband can lie carnally with his wife? And I mean, that's, you know, obviously a husband can have sex with his wife or wife sex with her husband either way. And that's not a negative thing. God approves of that. So, you know, I wonder if lie carnally can be used in that sense. Because um, I don't think it's... Ne and necessarily a negative thing, but what's negative here is that um, you know it's uh, somebody laying carnally with their neighbor's wife, and that's when the adultery part comes in. Leviticus 19, and whosoever lieth carnally, which again means to uh, you know fulfill the the desires of the flesh or to to gratify you know the sensual desires with a woman that is a bondmaid betrothed to a husband and not at all redeemed nor freedom given she shall be scour scourged they shall not be put to death because she was not free and uh, so I'm not going to comment a lot on these it seems like they're talking about adultery but really what I want to look, look at is the New Testament verses you can see we've got more notes and stuff coming up here the last time we see carnally used and the Old Testament is in Numbers 5.13. It says, And a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manor. Okay. Then we go on to the New Testament, and the only times that we see it used in the New Testament, the word carnal or carnally is used by Paul in his letters, basically in Romans and I think 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and then we see it used in Hebrews. And so we're going to go over some of these verses, passages. First time we see it in the New Testament is Romans chapter 7 verse 14. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And I believe this is Paul talking about himself. Presently he was saying, I am carnal and that he is sold under sin. And so how do we understand that? I've done a video in Romans 7 that I think is pretty good. Obviously, I could redo it, but I think that, you know, the information is there. And I think in Romans 7, I've taken the position that it's Paul talking about his dual natures, how a believer has a dual nature. Um, you know, we still have the, we have a new man, but we also still have the old man, and there's, you know, a struggle. Um, with our old self and our new self. And so carnal has different meanings to different people. But 
there's a lot of different views on this on this verse on this whole chapter and so I've listed some of the false doctrines that I thought are taught in these verses and there are people who deny the dual nature they'll say well this is Paul talking about himself before he was saved or they'll say this is Paul talking about a saved an unsaved person not necessarily him or it's just a figure of speech where he is speaking as um, carnal nature itself or something like that. I mean, there's so many different views, but I think the correct one is, uh, I, I was looking at Study Light and I was looking at the commentaries again on this just to see if other people believe the same thing that I did because I think when I did my Romans 7 video I got it from a different article that uh, pointed out a lot of things that I agreed with that really helped me. And uh, so I want to look at study light and look at more commentaries. And I did see more men take this position. And uh, basically when Paul says that I am carnal, what he means is I am a mortal man. And when he says that he is sold under sin, it means that he was sold under sin as a child of the first Adam. The whole human race was. So basically when he says I am carnal, he means I am human. We're all human. And because we're human, we're born into a fallen nature. Okay, we have a fallen nature because of Adam and Eve. When they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they corrupted the whole human race. I do believe in a sin nature. I do believe that we're born with that. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't go away when we are born again. But we do become a new creature but, uh, you know, we have a new mind, and we'll talk about that later, too. And But the old one's still there, okay, until, until we uh, leave this body, until we go to be with the Lord, and then we know we'll be, be as Him. So there are people that, that deny that that's what, that that's what Paul meant. Um... You know, they'll say that there's people that will deny sin nature altogether, that we're not born sinful, and, you know, that has a lot of bad implications, I think, because Jesus is the only one that was without sin, and why would we all fall short of the glory of God if we're not all born with a sin nature? Why couldn't there be people who could live perfectly sinless? Um, so... So in this way, you know, when Paul says that he's carnal, and one of the reasons why I did this word study is because I wanted to look into this carnal Christian doctrine, and I'm going to get on into that later on. But some people might try to say that when Paul says, I am carnal, it means that, you know, he was like a sinful Christian. You know, he was very living a very sinful life as a Christian or something. And when people say sold under sin, when they see that, they'll think that it means that he's in bondage to sin, um, but it doesn't. And, you know, I guess there's some Calvinism uh, that could be taught in here, too. Um, I, was, I don't believe Calvinism, but I'm saying that's another false view of this, sold under sin, saying that, you know, could say that uh, they'd say that this is speaking of an unregenerate person. It's not talking about Paul, or it was talking about Paul when he was lost or something, and, and being in bondage to sin means, you know, that that he's basically reprobate or whatever. So I know I'm probably not making sense as I'm going through this, but I'm trying to. Uh, so in this sense, it doesn't mean that you know he's currently living a wicked, sinful life as a as a believer or something like that. It means that he's man, fleshly. Okay, that's what since he's saying, I am a mortal man, and because I'm a mortal man, I was sold under sin. Sold in, under sin in the Garden of Eden. And uh, as all men are, as all mankind, all mortal human beings, so I want to get away from that verse. Let's move on to the next one. Romans 8. 
Romans 8, verses 6 and 7 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So here we see a contrast between basically an unregenerate person and a saved person. The carnal mind and then the spiritual mind. We've got death, which is you know spiritual death, and then we got life, which is life eternal, and life to its fullest, and peace, peace with God. And because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And so people can look at this verse and say, well, see, the carnal mind is enmity with God, so, you know, anybody who's carnal cannot be uh, a saved person. It's speaking of an unregenerate person. And, you know, then they look at Romans 7, and it says, I am carnal. So if he's, if he's saying, I am carnal, then he would be at enmity with God, and Obviously, you know, while he was writing the epistle, he was born again. So they'll say, you know, he was speaking of himself in the past, or he is speaking of himself, uh, you know, or he's using a figure of speech, speaking as an unregenerate person, or something like that. But, you know, it's a different context there, where he says, I am carnal. Um, so he doesn't mean he's carnal in the way that he's living his life, but he's carnal... And the, and the way that he is as a being, um, as we all are, mortal men. But in Romans 8, 6, and 7, we see that contrast. And so the carnal mind is the unre unregenerate person who, you know, before a person is born again, all we have is the carnal mind. Because we're, we're we're carnal and we're we're sold in our sin, we're born with a sin nature, so we're carnally minded. But when you become born again, we have the mind of Christ, and you can read about that in First Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen. And so that's kind of these are kind of uh, interesting, important verses here. And, of course, Calvinists love Romans chapter 8. And they'll say, you know, the carnal uh, mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. So speaking of an unregenerate person, and then it says, neither indeed can be. And so they'll say, see, pers or, you know, lost people can't be saved because God chose them to be lost, and he created them as reprobates. Uh, to go to hell without any chance of redemption, which is absolutely wrong and wicked. And so, um, just because it says the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law, and, and it's neither can be, that's only if they remain, you know, in the carnal minded state. That doesn't mean that, you know, an unregenerate person can't repent and put their faith in Christ because obviously they can because God commands it and calls for it all over scripture he commands us to preach the gospel so that men will repent and believe in Christ and so uh, you know he offers salvation to whosoever will so um, it just it means that you know the carnal mind can't be subject to the law of God um, you know, you need to be spiritually minded. And, and how do you be spiritually minded? Well, then you repent and put your faith in Christ. So, let's look at Romans 15, verse 27. And we're getting closer to the important verse here. Um, not a whole lot to say about this one, I don't think. But it says, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And we see another verse like this later on that will go over kind of the same thing, talking about ministering spiritual things and, and reaping carnal things, saying that, uh, you know, if ministers of the gospel, you know, they traveled a lot then and, and this and that, and so uh, they thought, you know, they should get 
clothing and food, you know, food and raiment and drink or whatever to, you know, to get them by for the time. And uh, I don't think that's right that a lot of people that preach or pastors or whatever, people who work in the ministry today, will use stuff like this, like Brian Denlinger, <laughs> to demand or to feel entitled to carnal things from uh, people who, you know, he's taught to or whatever. I don't think that's right to use these verses in that way. And, you know, I've been blessed a lot with donations and stuff like that. But, you know, and I've asked for help, you know, when I felt that I needed it maybe too much. But I don't think that I've ever demanded anything or felt entitled to anything. You know, I've always been grateful if, if you know, I've received anything. And uh, I think people abuse verses like this. Obviously, uh, they feel entitled to because they spent their time in study and stuff and they put out videos for free or whatever else you know so what you should do it out of a labor of love and I think things are a little bit different today where um, you know I don't think it's wrong if people want to support people like that but um, you know we're not traveling and, and it's good it's kind of a different world in different ways but Anyways, let's move on to the main verse here, or passage, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 1, and then 1 through 3. So, at the beginning here it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you, or as unto you, unto you as unto spiritual, <laughs> is that right? But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So this basically has to do with easy believism, and uh, carnal Christian doctrine, well they'll, they'll get that from this verse, and um, they might even say that Paul said he was carnal or something, which would not be right at all. And, and their interpretation of a carnal Christian. Um, so easy believism, you know, they believe, you know, they think that they are the ones who teach salvation is by grace through faith. But they take an extreme... Um, position on that, and one of the, the things is that they really twist a lot of verses, and, you know, people may think that it's just about salvation being by grace through faith for easy believism, but there's a lot more to it than that, and they twist a lot of things, take a lot of things out of context, and this is one instance of that. And you can look up Stephen Anderson, six, you know, S. Anderson, sixteen eleven, carnal Christian, and you'll see that he he defends the carnal Christian doctrine. And I was going to show a clip of that, but he doesn't really explain, you know, what what the carnal Christian doctrine is. But I, I'm going to take a guess that from what I've heard from other people and stuff that you know he's going to believe the same thing. And basically, the carnal Christian doctrine is that easy believism teachers say somebody can go on living you know exactly as they were living before they got saved they made a profession of Christ but it, it doesn't show in their life at all there's no evidence of salvation you know they don't have a new love for scripture they don't have a new love for prayer they don't have a new love for fellowship with the brethren they you know haven't they have no godly sorrow uh, no repentance or anything like that in their lives. Okay, they they go on living just like a lost person, and there's no difference between them and a lost person besides the fact that they made a profession of faith in Christ. So is that what's being said here? Paul's rebuking these people. He's saying, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, which would mean... Uh, you know, believers, 
people who are born again, spiritual, uh, who have the spirit of Christ. But also, you know, it could mean, you know, mature believers. But then he says, but he had to speak unto them as unto carnal, which in this case, you know, carnal uh, would mean unregenerate in this case. But then he says, even as unto babes in Christ. So he kind of softens the blow, pulls back a bit and says, uh, you know, basically kind of affirming that he does think that they're they're born again but you know it's almost so bad that it's almost as if they're unregenerate or if you know they're just they're just fresh in the faith and he thinks that they should be on this point by now uh, so it's a little upsetting for he says for ye are yet carnal for whereas there is among you envying and strife he says, ye are yet carnal. There's envying, strife, divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? When he says walk as men, he means unregenerate. I mean, obviously a lot of the people he's probably talking to are men. <laughs> so yeah, they walk as men, they are men. Well, he means unregenerate men. That's what he means when he says carnal, too. And you can see the contrast there. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? So he's speaking to saved people, he does say babes unto Christ, but yet he also says that it's almost as if they are, it's almost as if they are carnal, it's almost as if they are, are unregenerate. So this is where the, the people get that carnal Christian doctrine from. They say, well see these people are uh, saved, but they're living carnal, they are um, you know, they're living as, as lost men, but yet they're saved. But, the thing is that Paul is saying these men are carnal because of their glorying of men. Because there, there's envying, there's strife, there's, there's divisions, because some of them are saying, I am with Paul, and some of them are saying, I am with Apollos. Okay, they're glorying in men. They should be glorying in Christ. They should not be divided over, you know, who who has taught them or who has led them to the Lord. He's not saying that they are carnal in the sense that they are making sin the practice of their life. And you see, that's the difference between the easy believism teaching of a carnal Christian. And so I hope that you get that. Um, so that's basically, you know, the easy believism people say that carnal Christians are the ones who live exactly like the world, but they're saved. That's not at all what's being said here. They're just carnal in this one circumstance that they are being split over Paul and Apollos, okay? It's not that they're all drunkards and fornicators and doing this and that. You know, Paul would have kicked them out of the church. Paul would have rebuke them sharply uh, because of that, you know, they would have, you know, he would not have considered them brethren, you know. Um, so that's an extreme difference here. It's just this one area that he's saying that they're, they're acting as lost men in, not their entire lives. So I'm going to move on. 1 Corinthians 9 is basically uh, the sowing and spiritual things, reaping and carnal things type thing again. 1 Corinthians 9.11 For if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? Food, raiment, temporal goods. So we see that carnal can mean uh, carnal means, you know, earthly. It means temporal. Let's go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. This is a really interesting, good verse. We see that carnal can mean weak. It's kind of contrasted with mighty here. Mighty and, and God. Uh, so carnal is temporal, earthly, fleshly. Um, you know, it has to do with mankind. It's weak as opposed to mighty. An interesting thing to me when I was looking at some commentaries on this verse is that, you know, a lot of times I think, and maybe other people think this way, and maybe because, you know, we are men, uh, 
is that when it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, a lot of times you think about like being militant and you know we don't use the sword to to spread the gospel to force people into religion, right? We don't use you know we don't put a gun to somebody's head, tell them to believe in Christ. So I think kind of like literal physical weapons. But looking at all the commentaries, a lot of them uh, mention <coughs> that the weapons of the warfare are not carnal, meaning speech, or wealth, or force, or talent, or, f or fraud. So a lot of it's like speech, too. Like, we don't use eloquent speech and stuff to, to convince people of the gospel. You know, we use the power of God and, you know, his word, his spirit, and uh, those are mighty, and, you know, all these um, eloqu eloquent speech and um, sophistry and all that, you know, that's carnal and uh, and weak compared to the true power of God and the gospel. So that's interesting. Then we got Hebrews 7 and 9. Something else that's interesting to me is that the only time that we see carnal used in the New Testament is in the epistles of Paul and in Hebrews. And so there's a lot of debate about who wrote the book of Hebrews or the letter to the Hebrews. And a lot of people think that Paul wrote it or he had somebody write, write it. And it's basically in his words. And it's interesting that the only time we see carnal is, is used with Paul and in Hebrews. So I wonder if that's kind of another evidence of that, that Paul wrote Hebrews. Because that's how, you know, we kind of, that's how people examine and come to that conclusion in the book of Hebrews because they see similar words used, they see similar phrases, or, you know, just the way that Paul talked. Um, and so this is a small thing. I don't know if this would really be used as as an evidence of that, but... It is interesting, uh, you know, it's not used in, in Peter's epistles or in John's epistles. But Hebrews seven sixteen says, Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. And so the carnal, a carnal commandment means external compared to spiritual. It means outward versus uh, keeping in the heart. Okay carnal commandment is external and the power but that after the power of an endless life and there was some debate in the commentaries of what that means the power of an endless life and it could be the power of the gospel also um, and who is made without looking at the uh, I think it's speaking of Jesus I don't know without looking at the actual passage but the main focus is to look at the word carnal in these and basically kind of the same thing in Hebrews 9.10 which says which stood only in meat, meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances <coughs> imposed on them until the time of reformation so um these carnal ordinances and commandments were only external and um, obviously a lot of the Jews, the Pharisees or the scribes, they followed these ordinances, these commandments <coughs> you know they tried to follow them to a T but inwardly you know they were lost, they, they didn't have faith and that's what really matters at the end of the day, that's what the book of Hebrews talks about I think that's all I gotta say, really. Um, but we should understand that the carnal Christian, this First Corinthians chapter three, verses one through three, is not giving an excuse to people who say they're believers to live completely wicked as lost people. That's not what the passage is doing. That's not what Paul was saying. He's not saying, you know, we should consider people like that as carnal Christians. We should consider people like that as lost. Okay. Um, they were only carnal in the sense that they were envying, or they were, you know, arguing over uh, 
you know, I'm of Paul and I'm of, I'm of Paulus. So thank you guys. I'd like to hear your comments on this stuff if you have any more input. And thanks for watching. God bless.